Good morning, everybody. My name is Tracy Polachek, and welcome to the first uh, th of three presentations centered around effective practices for working with high crisis employees. Um, I see that some of the par participants are still coming in. I'm just going to do a quick intro here. Uh, these trainings are offered in partnership with Elevate Rapid City, the Children's Home Society, the Career Learning of the Black Hills, and my practice, Polichek Therapy and Consulting. Um, my name is Tracy Polichek. As I said, I've been in human services, mental health, and community-based systems work for over 20 years. That makes me seem old. Um, I'm a trauma-trained licensed professional counselor, and I've also uh, am an advocate for those struggling in the crisis of poverty. Um, I have a passion for changing and creating systems uh, in which we can all thrive, both the people who are serving people and the people that we are serving. We should make systems always strive to be best for everyone involved. Um, I really believe in using the latest research-based methods to help people achieve better outcomes across the board. Um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to an amazing person, Tiffany Petro, who's my uh, partner in crime for these presentations. Um, I wanted to tell you that these trainings that we're going to give that are part of a three-part series, these are really a teaser or they aim to give you a taste of what we hope to offer you in the spring or summer of 2021. We are going to be doing an amazing innovative training centered around just the topic of today. How can we work with high crisis employees using the science of behavior, using brain science, using what we know about the body and what we know about our social systems and the unique obstacles that our employees face. How can we tailor our systems to do that? And we want to, you're gonna be able to come in and bring your team. You're gonna learn all kinds of cool stuff. And then with experts on hand, you're going to drill down on a five or five to seven of these tips and practices. And you're gonna be able to have time and guidance in writing practices and policies unique to your agency or your business. And you're going to be able to take those home that day and implement them at your workplace. You'll also have access to support from Tiffany and I and Lori's coming later on. If you want to bring us in to, to do trainings periodically, to help you do audits on these things, to make your business and your agency uh, better. It's going to increase your revenue. It's going to lower your turnover and you are going to have management and staff that have higher morale. What can be better than that? Right? So I wanted to just tell you that I should also define a little bit about what is a high crisis employee before we start this whole process. So a high crisis employee are typically what we would call the working poor a lot of times. These are folks and and granted this isn't this is even more important in these times of COVID, right? COVID has made people take stock of their resources. It has had people losing jobs, doing different things, trying to go into different businesses, scrambling to provide. It's, it's left employers going, I can't serve the way I used to serve. I need to innovate. I need to pivot. I need to know what's going on and I need to respond. So typically a high crisis employee is an employee who has instability in three main areas, childcare, housing, transportation, which are the biggest impactors on our businesses for our staff. They sometimes have experienced uh, adverse childhood experiences, which you're going to find out exactly what that is and how that impacts them. So they've got trauma in their lives that they've been dealing with, and they basically move from crisis to crisis to crisis. And so we need to know what they're facing, how they're facing it, so we can help our systems be designed around their success. I want to introduce you to, uh, I want to let you guys know that these trainings also will be available if you missed it today and you want to refer somebody, they're going to be available on Elevate Rapid City's YouTube channel. This will be a three-part series happening every Wednesday, this Wednesday, and two more at 11 a.m. at this time. Um, I will be answering, Tiffany has to duck out a little bit later today, 
a little bit earlier today, so I'll be answering some questions at the end of the chat. You'll also have access to our contact information. If you have questions or would like to contact us about coming in and doing some training for your business or agency. I'm going to introduce you to somebody who I love and admire and I've had the pleasure of working with for many, many years. She is the Tiffany Petro. She is the director of advocacy and prevention and she oversees the Children Home Society and multiple statewide awareness and education education campaigns. So she oversees their multiple awareness and statewide education campaigns. She is an adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. You're going to find out about that master trainer and fellow. And she is just an all around human services rock star. So you are getting the best of the best today. I'm going to turn it over to her and then you'll see me after she's done. I will be talking to you giving you some tips about employee engagement using our research-based methods. So Tiffany, welcome. Thank you for that warm introduction, Tracy. I feel like, ooh, the bar has been set high, but um, I am honored to be here with Tracy. So let's dive right into it. Um, talking about adverse childhood experiences, where do we start? So when we talk to employers or employees, often we might get a little bit like, do I really need to know the brain science behind this? Um, absolutely, because if we can understand the, the science of it all, we can start to understand the why behind those behaviors, right? And so we always start, at, I call it seventh grade math science. So if anybody's a science guru in the audience, correct me if I get any of this wrong, but this idea that our bodies are just walking through this world taking in information and because we're our bodies are trying to keep us alive and survive we're taking in a lot of messages right and so we get that you know is this table hot is it cold will this chair support me right my body's taking in those messages and it's trying to help me navigate this world and we get that about safety what we don't always consider is that we're also taking in messages about psychological and emotional safety are you good for me? Do you have good intentions? I'm not sure that I should trust you. And so as we're unpacking this idea of, of trauma and trauma-informed practices, remember that those individuals who have, as, as Tracy defined them as high crisis, those individuals who have experienced a lot of trauma or chaos or toxic stress have the hardest time connecting. So let's figure out why. So we first have to define trauma. What is trauma, right? And understanding that um, when we talk about trauma, it, it looks a little bit different. Go ahead, Tracy. So this could be an event or a series of events or circumstances. So when we talk about different levels of stress, here's the good news. Things don't have to be perfect. Science has actually proven that tolerable stress, stress in which I feel like I can do this. I have the skills necessary to overcome this. Those actually build up a person's resilience and build up healthy coping skills. When we talk about trauma or toxic stress, we're moving into those moments where um, we don't feel like we have hope or support. We don't feel like we have somebody that we can lean on or ask for help. Maybe you found yourself in moments like those. COVID-19 has us feeling a lot of stress, some more than others of going, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to have daycare. I don't know how I'm going to, school's going to go from level three to level one, right? Or back and forth. And, and how trauma impacts us. Remember, we're taking in all of those messages. Trauma can actually change us. It can change us on a cellular level changes how we see and interact with the world around us. And so, although we have different perceptions of trauma, how Tracy views an incident might be different than how I view it, we know that those incidents can have long lasting effects on not just our health, but also social problems or other types of adversity. So let's talk about ACEs, because uh, Tracy's keyed us up and certainly has piqued our interest about this. ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. Those are experiences that happen in the first 18 years of life or the formative years. Now, stick with me because we're not talking just about kiddos here. 
those kiddos grow up to be adults who have had those life experiences, those li that lived experience. And what we found about ACEs through the um, largest epidemiology study of its kind is that it changes the way that our brain works. And what we're talking about today is a transition of a mindset of saying, yes, you may have had a lived experience or you may have had adverse childhood experiences, but that does not define you. That does not mean that you are broken or you are unrepairable or that you cannot be a functional employee. So make sure that you hear that we're not talking in that if you've had a traumatic childhood, that that means that you get to do and behave however you want. What it means is just that you live and interact with the world around you in a very different way. And part of what we are called to do as a community, as an employer, as a boss, is to meet our individual staff where they're at based on their strengths. And here's the reality about adverse childhood experiences. We all got them, right? Um, what you're looking at on the screen is actually from the original study in 95 and 97. So Dr. Onda, who worked for CDC, same CDC that we're dealing with now, um, con con uh, connected with Dr. Felitti, who was working with Kaiser Permanente, and they were doing individual studies that were somehow um, connected at looking at do our experiences tell us what kind of um, outcomes or adults that we're going to come into? Now, they did a study with over 17,000 individuals, but they didn't cherry pick a community that was going to have adversity. It wasn't a tribal community or an inner city borough or the streets of Chicago. This was a highly affluent community in San Diego. In fact, these 17,000 were 70% Caucasian and 70% uh, higher educated. And when they boiled it down, when they looked at health outcomes and they did questionnaires about trauma, this is what they found is that 27% of that 17,000 said, yep, somebody in my, a parent or a guardian or a caretaker struggled with substance abuse. 17% had mental illness. 6% said, yep, somebody went to prison or jail. They experienced neglect and they experienced childhood, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. Now, when we talk about an ACE score, it, it, it's not about how many times the experience happened. Um, it was about how many different types of trauma you experienced. Now, you might be reflecting on these and you may see yourself on this page. Um, you also might be saying, hey, I had something happen, but it's not there. It was the 90s. They did the best they could, right? It was before we were really talking about trauma-informed care and principles. And they looked at the biggest impactors on child development. And ultimately, what they knew is that trauma changes us. And it doesn't matter if you have a 10 or a zero. It changes each individual person um, in an individual way. And when I talk about we all have them, go ahead, Tracy. So much so that 87% of the time, if you have one ACE, you're likely to have two. That means trauma clusters together. Lived experience happens together. Now, you might be asking yourself, how, what, how does this pertain to me? How does it show up in my workplace and my staff? Understanding that the idea, the old age adage about mm, leave your personal life at the door, that doesn't work anymore. We are who we are. We are made up of all of our experiences, both good and bad. And I like to think about it like a little suitcase, right? And so we all have this little suitcase and we fill it with our lived experiences, good and bad. And, and when we're taking care of ourselves and we have good coping skills or we go and talk to somebody like Tracy and we learn new things, my suitcase is well organized. And that means when I hit a bump in the road, like I get in trouble at work, uh, I get into a fight with a coworker, I can't pay a bill. It's a bump in the sidewalk, but my suitcase stays nice and neat and packed. I figure out how to overcome it. But for all too many people, every all of those lived experiences are just thrown in their suitcase. We were packed in a hurry, right? And, and you're throwing everything in there and you're sitting on it to make sure it's closed and, and your sleeves hanging out the edge. And you hit a bump in the sidewalk and guess what happens? <laughs> Trauma spills out all over the place. Those are the experiences that we're seeing in the workplace today. 
We're seeing big emotions, big feelings. And sometimes as an employer, I have staff that I lead. Sometimes I'm confused about what did I do? What happened here? And, and we're going to help give you some tips. Uh, Tracy's going to help you give you some tips about that. But understanding that if we can understand their journey, if we can change the question from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, we create a different engaging dialogue. But it's not just about trauma and how that plays out. There are some other factors that really play into us as employers creating a world of safety. So this in particular study looked at impacts on overall health. Now, when people often think about trauma and the symptoms of trauma, as I like to refer them to, they might think of something like drug abuse or addiction, um, homelessness, poverty. They think about some of those social type problems. And this study found that those health behaviors choosing or, or not choosing to drink or smoke or, or have multiple sexual partners, that actually only accounted for 30% of overall health and well-being. 40% was related to socioeconomic factors, such as my zip code and where I live. Do I feel safe in my community? Do I have people to support me? Is my job secure? Do I have the education to become the person that I need? 10% was about that physical environment, and 20% was about access to quality health care. And so as we're, as we're entering into this journey and, and, you're, talk, and you're, try, you're starting to reflect about what this means for you, your workplace, and your agency, understand that although we can't control everything in the community, this is really about a holistic response to, to serving people right where they're at. Now, certainly trauma does impact um, health and social problems and later adversity. Um, this was a chart from the original 95-97 um, study with the original 17,000. And you can see it has a stepwise fashion. ACEs are like gas in the car. The more ACEs you have, the more risk there is for these health and social problems. So as your a score increases, so does the percentage or the likelihood that you may develop some of these things, such as anxiety or asthma or experiencing homelessness or being unhoused. Now, if you haven't found your A score, you're not quite sure, maybe you took a quick tally. Um, it's one point if you had those experiences and then zero if you didn't. Understanding that an A score is really meant to be reflective. It doesn't tell me what kind of employee I'm gonna hire. It doesn't tell me about your strength and your resilience and your grit and your tenacity. It tells me a historical look at how did I get to where I'm at? How did my lived experience um, get me to this place? Now, remember how I said that we each had our own individual perception of trauma. Understanding that you might have several siblings that you've hired, or I think about my, myself being a sibling set of three, the different paths that we have taken, um, we experienced our lives differently. And so it is an individual process. And so I think about that now in the times of COVID about just how diverse reactions are. And, and Tracy, maybe you have something you wanna add about that, but this idea of there are people who feel like this is no big deal. We're just gonna go to work, have our, you know, do our day to day, all the way up to people who are really living in a place of fear. Now, that spectrum of response impacts you, right, as their employer, as their place of employment, but no one's right or wrong. They're walking through that experience with their little suitcase, and they see that through a specific lens. And so we want to, while we don't ever want to normalize the experience of having experienced trauma, we want to normalize this idea that it doesn't make you unemployable or it doesn't make you not valuable to your community. It just means that you're bringing something different and a different perspective to the table. The thing about trauma is that 
we can certainly sit here and say this doesn't, you know, this doesn't include me, I, you know, adverse childhood experiences, you know, get over it, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We can certainly sit here and have that conversation. But the research is very clear. We're going to pay for trauma in some way. We're either going to, to pay billions of dollars to repair a child who has experienced child abuse and neglect or we're going to pay it through health insurance costs and premiums, um, the amount of tax dollars going to build new prisons and jail systems, the amount of health care costs, um, trips to the hospital. This was a study when we, uh, from Tennessee, and they looked at how ACEs or adverse childhood experiences were actually impacting their work absenteeism. So I used to work in a very large office and um, when someone was gone, it, we, de we definitely felt that, right? Other people had to pick up those caseworks, uh, those load, those caseloads, excuse me, those, those visits, those visits with parents. When we look at the bottom line, as a community, we are going to pay for not addressing trauma in one way or another. We're either gonna pay through it through uh, health and social problems like increased, uh, increased um, criminal activity or, or communities not feeling safe or experiences or interactions um, with the justice system, or we're gonna pay for it financially, <clears throat> right? And we're gonna be the ones that are, are having to pay for those social services or having to pay for those, those city budget increases those hospital visits. So understanding that this really is about us. What can we do right where we're at with what we have? Which is what Tracy's gonna talk about. Just some tips. Thank you, Tiffany, that was amazing. I think that was a really good overview of what I just love about this at its core is it is amazing to think that we carry our history with us and that everything we've experienced impacts not just our psychological health, not just how we feel about things or how we view the world, it impacts our physical health. And I think that is just so interesting to look at and how much does healthcare cost us? How much does counseling cost? How much, what are the community costs? I mean, I really love, I love the frame of that. Um, I want to, talk about employee engagement um, a little bit because of the time of COVID. I wanna frame it in what Tiffany just talked about. And I wanna say this, um, it is costing you as an employer. Um, a recent research suggests on average for entry level workers. And when I mention entry level workers, I'm talking about your domestic working group. I'm talking about waitresses, waiters, bartenders. I'm talking about those hospitality uh, things, those fast food, uh, met, which many of our high crisis employees have to access as work because of their current instability, because of their education levels currently, and because living high crisis life does not mean that you have time or resources to pursue education in, in most, most cases, right? They are not in that realm. So they have to often work two or three jobs, part-time positions. So if you are an agency or an owner who are employing from this group of people, research suggests that those no calls, no shows, those dysregulated, emotional dysregulation moments where something small in your mind happens. And as Tiffany put it, your suitcase just pops open and your trauma goes everywhere. And you have employees walking out because we don't have managers who are trained to deal with that or understand it or recognize it, or because we have really rigid rules around if you make a mistake, you're done, you're fired. That's actually costing you as an employer on average of $6,000 per year per employee. When you factor in your management having to take over those roles, hiring and retraining, when you factor in all of that turnover, that is costing you money. And so from a bottom line standpoint, it is, it's absolutely going to be cost saving for you to learn these things and, and implement them. And I want to say one more thing that's really, really important. I myself as a small business owner, 
I grew up in this community. I know many people in business here and they are all fantastic, wonderful people. They want to help our communities. What better way to help your community by using innovative techniques that make you feel better about work, keep families employed, high crisis families employed, which guess what that does? That creates stable families where kiddos grow up and are less likely to experience adverse childhood experiences, which equals a more stable community for all of us. And that's what we want. We want higher levels of education in our community. We want lower calls for service from police, from violence, from domestic violence. All of those things can happen by you as an employer doing your part to keeping people employed. And you can do it in a way that benefits you as well, not only financially, but it also benefits you because the techniques that you'll learn at this larger training are techniques that are gonna have you feeling better about how you're delivering staff discipline, how you're delivering staff motivation, how you're designing things. So I think it's a win-win. I hope I've made that point. Um, I'm going to dive in here a little bit on employee engagement in crisis situations. Now, COVID-19 is a perfect frame for a crisis situation. It's happening not only to your employees, it's happening to your business, it's happening to all of us. But this can also mean small employee crises. Like you have a, you have a, an employee employee right now who's going through a divorce. You have an employee who is needing to manage or have you be flexible with something because of something that's happening in their lives. So why is employee engagement important? So this is the first way that we talk about behavioral sciences interacting a lot with the workforce. We want to engage employees. We want to have a proactive response, which I'm going to talk about next, because what we want to do is we want to understand we want to design and we want to do things as much as possible in an active way before crisis happens or during a crisis rather than reacting to crisis, which is how high crisis employees are often living. They're putting out fires, putting out fires. So we want to have a relationship in place. Relationship is the number one factor that determines outcomes across the board. And I'll give you a good example. Um, in my field of work as a mental health therapist, uh, the number one factor that determines my client's success in therapy is not the type of therapy I, that I might do. It's not the number of letters behind my name, whether I'm a doctor or a doctor, 10 doctorates or whatever. It's not those things. It is actually my ability as a therapist to impart hope and to build relationships with this person. So if you have a good professional relationship, meaning you understand their situation, you're consistent, you're safe in your communication, and your client or your staff knows they have a mechanism to address issues with you, and you come at it from a calm, problem-solving, we're in this together approach, your outcomes with that person skyrocket. You'll receive loyalty. You'll receive knowing ahead of time so you can mitigate crisis that might come. And you'll again, avoid turnover, avoid those things that are costing your business money and creating instability again for your staff. So let's talk about engagement. Um, Focusing on employee engagement means physical things, doing physical things. It means keep your door open literally. It means your employees know that you are here with them on the job. You want to be a physical presence, if at all possible, during consistent times during the day. This is a physical sign that shows you're part of the team. Um, and you also need to have a mechanism in place that knows, hey, if my door is open, stop in for a few minutes, right? We're going to do a deeper dive into check-ins next week. Um, but you want to be seen around the office in times of crisis. There's nothing for morale, like seeing you pitching in, jumping on the line, making a hamburger right along with everybody. When, when you're short staffed, there's nothing that says we're a team as you actually physically going out and showing you're a team. Um, you want to promote team mentality. Um, 
this is where you talk about we. You don't don't have three hour meetings. Please don't. I don't care what kind of business you were in. It's horrible. And people who have high crisis brains are finely tuned for physical stimulation for short amount of solution focused things. So a long meeting where you read the board report or drone on and on about something is not really helpful in promoting a team mentality. You want to say, hey, here's information and I'm gonna tailor how you get information to what I know about how you receive information best, right? People want to help. So to keep this team mentality, you want to create these, what I call problem solving groups. Um, I, I jumped ahead a bit because I wanna say this, in times of crisis, everyone wants to help. You as an employer do not need to swoop in and solve everything. You can look to your staff and should look to your staff because let me tell you something amazing about the high crisis brain. It has many gifts. One of them is they are amazing problem solvers. They have to solve every kind of problem from how to get a ride, how to get daycare, how to feed my family on a budget of this. If the walking dead apocalypse ever happens, you want a high crisis friend because they know how to get things done. Ask your employees, what are some things do you think that we could do here that could help if we're short staffed? You don't need to solve that all, but create these groups, give them a mechanism for solving them and giving them, give them a place to tell you what they think would be great. Look for the wins. When an employee comes in and does something great, relationship building, telling people they're doing a good job, putting it out on a Facebook page, putting it out in a stream, that's gonna be really helpful and calming for people in a time of crisis. Even during this, look at what you're doing, it's amazing. I think that in the, in the problem solving groups, I wanna say something else. We often can maximize the crisis brain by really understanding how they communicate in their real life, what's valuable to them and using those communication streams. So we wanna create and maintain crisis communication channels. These don't always have to be crisis. I, I think you should just be doing this with communication channels, but in a crisis, it's particularly important. You want to, Make sure, for example, have, if you have some information to communicate, like, hey, I need a staff person to come in. Can anybody do this? Somebody needs a ride to work. That you create a space where employees will check first and check often, and it's brief communication, and it's quick and problem solving, and it's also a mechanism to, to put, put little wins in there. Good job, guys. Thanks for pitching in. Create that and maintain it. So have a designated person. I think Facebook is great. I think a, I think some anything that's on your smartphone, any kind of communication app that you can look at scheduling and doing those things for the high crisis brain is very important because they are about immediate information and responding immediately. Um, Remember that this is not always going to go smoothly. So you want to plan ahead and offer concrete help and resources. Now, in times of crisis, we're talking about high crisis employees. We're talking about planning ahead. That sometimes does it. How do I plan ahead for a crisis? You have a crisis plan. Don't you have one? A crisis plan says that I as a leader, and this is where I'm going to come in here with this proactive versus reactive leadership. I, as a leader, adopt what I like to call the of course mentality. If I own a fast food business in Rapid City, South Dakota, of course, I will have to deal with no calls, no shows. So when that happens, I'm not going to be reactive and spill my suitcase full of my trauma all over the place and be angry about it. I, as a leader, am going to say, of course I will have this. So what will I do whenever there's a no call, no show? What's my backup plan? I will identify a staff person or two staff people who have agreed to cover for no calls, no shows at an extra rate of pay, at an extra bonus. Maybe it's meals. Maybe it's meals at your fast food place. Maybe it's a punch card for 10 meals. If that, if you thinking outside of the box, having that crisis plan, but I will identify those two people. What if those two people are unavailable? Then I will have a plan for that. That's this part about if you're going to work in an environment or own a business where you are employing people who are high crisis, you have to have a calm, 
proactive response. Of course, I will have clients whose childcare, or I will have staff whose childcare will fall through at the last minute. Do I have a plan for that? The first plan is going to be how I verbally respond. I'm so sorry to hear that, Jane. Um, our crisis childcare plan is this. I have a contract with this agency, with this childcare center. You are able to bring them over there during the day for this amount of time. I, and you will be able to, um, we'll be able to work that out later. Uh, or you can come in an hour later, get some childcare arranged, and you'll be able to come in an hour later and we can make up that hour another time. Of course, mentality says, I will plan for things that often happen in my high crisis business. I will not be angry about them. I will expect them and I will get amazing at dealing with them when they happen. I will deal with them with calm. I will deal with them with already set solutions and flexibility. I will not take it personally or blame the people that I'm hiring because I know that they're living high crisis lives, that they have so many things that they can't control. And the, the real definition of high crisis too is that we don't have a backup plan if we're in a high crisis world. We rarely have resources to have a back. Our life is not stable enough yet we're working towards stability to have a, a comprehensive backup plan. I might have two or three things I can try, but I want to turn to you as a boss and say, I don't want to lose my job. How can I navigate this childcare thing? How can I navigate transportation? How can I navigate this? So you will have a proactive plan. You will say, of course, somebody's sick just during the holiday rush. And I can handle this because I am an amazing proactive leader, right? So you're going to shift your mindset to that, right? I think it's also good to reframe this in your mind. I go into this in much more detail in our larger presentation, but for those of us who are in the middle class, our systems are designed around middle class values. Middle class values say that I have I am a long-term planner. I have a backup plan. I do not run from crisis to crisis. If I have a car trouble, I can call two or three people because in my middle-class world, I have some stability. If I am struggling in the crisis of poverty and I am the working poor, mostly everyone that I know and love is also struggling in the crisis of poverty. So I, while I have amazing relationships and people that love me, they may not always have the means to help me in, in the most immediate ways or meaningful ways. And so I need to really understand that as a business owner. So if I design my rules around middle class norms and expectations, but I'm hiring those folks from that are struggling in the crisis of poverty, how can I expect them to totally be successful with those rules? So there are many things we can do and really flexibility is one of them. It's how can I design shifts? How can I do these things? And we go much more in detail into what businesses have done in those research in our larger presentation. But that is the mind shift that happens between proactive leadership and reactive leadership. I don't have to spend a lot of time on reactive leadership because you already know what that is. It's getting very angry when something happens. That's a second no show, no call. I'm sick of this work. This is just this, this is bad. Trust me as a therapist, the best thing you can do for your own mental health is to change your thinking around that, to say, people are struggling. People make decisions that I don't understand because we're not living the same lives. Now, does that mean that we throw rules out the window? No, but it does mean that when we're checking in with employees and we have ongoing relationships with them, we often have a heads up. This person doesn't have stable transportation. So I think I'm going to help them figure that out. Some businesses that we've worked with get very creative with that. They have gas cards, they have ride shares, they have, they go pick them up. I mean, while a client is getting stable and working towards stability for their family, that's the kind of help that helps them actually get out of that crisis of poverty. Research shows us that it takes an average of three to five years of somebody working very hard with access to crisis funding to help them through those times and mentoring and mentoring can be you as a boss or a manager saying, you can do this. I know your life is hard right now, but you can do this. 
One of the best examples I have of this is one of our partner agencies, the Career Learning Center of the Black Hills. They have amazing leadership, Gloria Plummer. They have amazing staff, Lori Larson, uh, is coming. She's going to be our guest speaker at our third presentation. They have committed to becoming a trauma-informed agency. The Career Learning Center of the Black Hills is where many of our high crisis folks, some not, but most of them are in high crisis, who are going there on their off hours, riding their bikes in below freezing weather to get their GEDs that they've been working two and three jobs. And so they're using one of our most effective research-based methods, which is resource navigation. They've hired a trauma coordinator, Lori Larson, who meets with these folks, who helps them navigate these issues of childcare transportation uh, and um, housing while they are getting stability helps them connect with job and workforce, provides the support they need and access to crisis funding so that they can remain employed, which is an amazing, amazing intervention that we know works with research. So I wanted to highlight that you're going to find out more in depth about research navigation at our third training. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions or comments, I'm going to try and attempt to read the chat here. I don't know, Rachel, if you can help me with that. Let me see. Okay. So if anybody has questions, comments, anything that we've covered today, I'm going to leave this open. I'm also going to give you, let me see if I can't, I'm having a little bit of computer issues here. Oops. Those who are on, feel free to use the chat box or the Q&A box to submit any of your questions. And we'll give it a couple minutes if um, you just want to think on your question and send it in. I also have put up some contact information for both myself and Tiffany Petro. If you have any questions that you think of later, um, if you have questions about the future uh, trainings that we're doing, we also offer trainings as part of our business. So if you'd like to contact us about coming into your agency or business, here is our contact info. Um, while you're thinking of questions, I just want to let you guys know that next week's topic, it will be December 9th at 11 a.m. And you can register at Elevate Rapid City. I think Rachel is going to put that registration um, in the chat in the URL. Um, next week's topic is designing interventions around the science of behavior. And Tiffany's going to go into some cool brain science and talk you through about how health and well being affect worker performance. And then I will be offering some research based tips for increasing outcomes using individual and group check ins, how you do this in the workplace that can take place of those boring meetings. We don't want any meetings, right? No one wants meetings. Um, and I, and I will also give you scripts for those check-ins and a script is really a written out format that you can take and customize uh, for yourself or your agency or your business. Okay. I think I've got, um, I've got a, I've got a question, so I'm going to answer it. Um, and that just a reminder um, that we will be in the third week, we will have Lori Larson come from the Career Learning Center and talk about the amazing work that they're doing there as an example of what you guys can be doing in your own agency. So let's see, I have a question here that says, in an office setting, what would you suggest to plan ahead for crisis? We're considering having staffs create standard operating procedures for their positions. Any thoughts on SOPs? I think that's great. I think it's great to have employees think about what, what could come up what has come up for me? What am I afraid of? And then what are those operating procedures that could happen? I think that is a fantastic idea. I think sharing it across an agency is really great too, because you can always learn something from each position. Um, so yes, I think that is a fantastic idea. Please email me and let me know how that goes. I would love to hear about that. Um, oh, Terry Liggins. Hi, Terry. What, what an awesome uh, rock star out there in the world doing amazing work um, at the Hurdle Life coach. So look him up. Do the work for adults in transition. Part of the work's pushing back against stigma. I'm curious to the origin of high crisis employees and rather or not you feel there's potential negative stigma. Yes, I do. I agree with you. Here's, here's really why I use the language high crisis employees, because I think that 
if we start talking about employees or the working poor or trauma in there, I feel that's even more negative. I feel like that's saying something has happened to them and that cannot be undone or that they're somehow unemployable. So we arrived at high crisis as a means to say, this is how they're living right now, that it's just a circumstance and it is made up of many factors, but that they are working towards stability. So it's not perfect. And if you come up with something better, let me know. But that's really why we use that term to describe that. Does that make sense? Okay, hopefully it does. Let's see if any more questions or comments, guys, because I'm looking in the, the chat. Okay. All right. Well, I wanted to just remind you all that this is part of a larger workshop that we have planned that we are hoping will be in person because our hope is that we have breakout rooms that you will be able to bring your teams into those rooms and have experts on site to develop these procedures. We are prepared to pivot if we need to and do a virtual summit, but that's why we're pushing this off a little bit more in the hopes that we can be in person. Um, so look, look and watch Elevate for the, the larger presentation spring summer 2021's registration and event details. Again, if you missed this and wanna refer this, these webinars will be featured on the Elevate Rapid Cities YouTube page. And I do have one more question here that popped in. How do you deal with being accused of favoring the high crisis employee because of all the special adjustments we make? That's a great question. Your, your agency will not be doing this for certain people. You will be doing this for all people people that you're hiring. And I'll tell you what that means. You will have a, uh, in the case where you might employ people who are not taking advantage of those services, you will still be offering them to everybody. And you will make that clear in that team mentality that if somebody's going through a hard time with transportation, childcare, housing, if, if this comes up, this is how we handle this. This is available for all of you. If somebody uh, has an emotional dysregulated incident and you decide not to fire them, but to work that out and come up with a comprehensive plan, you're going to make it clear to your employees that that's available to everybody, that we promote stability here and we help people as they're getting on their feet. And we do it in a really specific research backed way. And we do it and it's open for everybody. Trauma informed care, which is what we're talking about is healing informed care. And it's also person centered care. You're going to show all all your employees, nobody's going to feel favored because you are going to see the innate dignity and worth in every person. And everybody who's a little bit more stable is going to be the mentors. You're going to invite them in. Hey, you seem to be doing really well with this. Do you think you could work with Jane today and kind of help her out here to learn this a little bit better? You're going to invite people. So you're going to be dynamic at it. So hopefully people won't be feeling like there's favorites. I hope that, hope that answered your question. So... I want to thank you Gracie. guys for joining us today. Oh, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, there is um, one more question in the chat. Where can we oh. learn more about the crisis of poverty? Oh, excellent. Well, I there are several. One, you can call me and I'll come and do a Poverty 101 for your presentation, for your agency or business. Give me a call or email me. Um, I also encourage you to... Um, look at the work of Donna Beagle. You can Google her online. She has many books, Ruby Payne. Um, I have been reading and researching poverty for many years, and there's so much information out there. If you're looking for a training or a reframe, I definitely do those. We delve into the crisis of poverty, actually do local poverty. We talk about businesses a little bit, but we also talk about educational interventions, medical interventions, and things like that. So that's all, also an option for you. And there was one more, I think it's more of a comment, but not sure if you um, can touch on it. Um, just the comment that not everyone can work a special schedule due to childcare and they have to cover all shifts and how sometimes um, single moms get the best shifts. So not sure if it's, I know it's more of a comment, but I don't know if you have anything that you can add to that. That's an excellent comment. And we're going to go in depth in the larger presentation on how you do flexibility and scheduling. And there's actually really innovative ways to do that. You never want employees to feel like because somebody has a special circumstance, they always get this special shift. You want to make sure that if you do that or offer that, that it's open to everybody. You do have to have kind of parity and fairness. But, but one of the things that you can do um, is 
you can offer incentives. If, if somebody doesn't have childcare during certain times, they can't take that position. We know that single moms, that is the number one factor for them in determining work is that they often are the sole providers and caregivers and daycare does not extend past five o'clock. And if it does, it is hard to find and are really expensive. And so it is difficult for a single mom, for example, to be, or a single dad to be taking those evening shifts. So in light of that, one of the things you can do is offer a differential for doing it or, or offering some type of childcare. We've had businesses who actually uh, have their own childcare for when that happens. We, we, have business, we have businesses that offer flexibility, meaning they might not be able to work the entire shift, but they could come in during the busiest parts because they're able to get childcare for two hours or three hours. So again, it is, a, it is difficult in parity, but we want to talk about creativity. So I don't have time to explain every single flexible intervention, but we do go through that in our larger training. Any other questions, Rachel? I'm not, I only see them, I think, when they're click. Oh, here. I'm, I'm not seeing any um, anything else coming through. Okay. Okay. I want to remind you guys next week, we will be talking about designing interventions around the science of behavior. It'll be Tiffany and I again next week, doing a little bit of a deeper dive, December 9th at 11 a.m. If you think of any questions or want to discuss anything, please reach out to me. You'll see my contact info here. And thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for your commitment to making really amazing systems work for everyone.